to um, say a massive, massive good morning to everyone. Um, it's lovely to have you here with us. My name is Andrea Davis. I am the Regional Training Manager of the North Eastern Scotland, and I am here um, hosting this morning's session uh, with the fantastic Dr. Joanne Collins. Um, the webinar, as you know, is returning to the office, prioritising your mental health. Um, <clears throat> sorry, the uh, webinar should last around one hour. So we want maximum engagement, lots of questions throughout, sharing your experiences with Joanne, comments and your thoughts as we go along. Um, I've noticed in the chat box that we do have people working from home, people who are in the office, people who are working um, hybrid as well. Um, so whether you're in the office or not, this, this webinar is completely relevant to you. Um, so we do want to hear, hear your thoughts and um, your experiences as we go along. Um, just to let you know that this webinar is um, a bite-sized um, session of the full course which we are conducting in uh, October, which is Normalising Emotional and Mental Health in the Workplace. That will be taking place on the 27th of October. And we'll give you a little bit of information towards the end about the full day course. But we do hope you enjoy this session and please do, um, you know, speak in the chat box, maximum engagement. Um, you know, at your time is um, is valuable for this session, your, your chats and um, all of your conversations and experiences. We do want to hear from you. Um, so we will. Yeah. So thank you for your message there. We will be um, doing a full day course on this and we'll provide further information at the very end. So. Without further ado, just a bit about Joanne, not to embarrass you, Joanne. Um, Joanne is a family and systemic uh, psychotherapist. Her background is teaching in the field of social care and emotional mental health within both educational and workplace settings. She has a private practice where she works therapeutically with children, adolescents, uh, adults, couples and families with very emo uh, various emotional difficulties. Uh, so I'm not going to take any more of your time, Joanne. I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is very, um, it is such a different way of engaging with the world. Despite more than 18 months working online, I'm still adjusting. Um, I'm looking at the chat and seeing how friendly people are. Um, Geraldine and Sue are particularly bringing smiles to my faces, to my faces, to my face. Um, so what I wanted to do was help us connect. I say connect, we've been living the lockdown. Now, please, because I'm very, very used to uh, speaking with people and seeing them and engaging with them. I'm really, really encouraging you to use the chat box. Um, and speak to me because normally as a psychotherapist, I wouldn't speak this much. I would be really encouraging conversation and listening and trying to respond to what it is you want. So just throw out those questions and I'll respond the best I can. Now, what I wanted us to do was start with grounding ourselves in the whole idea of what we've been living through. I mean, how many of us have ever lived through a global pandemic? or a global lockdown? And how many of us would want to repeat it? How many of us were completely, this is not gonna happen, people are overreacting. You know, the lockdown was it introduced a completely different world into our world. And I think it took a little while to believe it was real. And then where I, I live in South London, and uh, when and because it was really hot, I looked out the window and I couldn't tell that we were in a lockdown because loads of people were partying. There was music, there was noise that the young people were getting ready to finish school. You know, it was like carnival or Mardi Gras, like someone said, where I lived. So it. Oh, someone says I need to check my audio. Can fine. You... We can hear you fine. It's um, it's I think it's an issue at their end. So, OK, cool. Um, so lockdown brought, once people realized it was real, and I think it got particularly real, the darker and colder it got, it brought a lot of fear and worry, concern to many people, especially those in isolated and vulnerable groups. 
we learned how interconnected we were as a world and we had to think about interactions and the consequences of our interactions so you know we had to think if i if i want to visit my grand and i go to this place can i still do this and you know who's going to do the shopping and who's going to drop this where and there was just a lot of things that we didn't have to think about before that became very present in our minds. We learned that we had more resilience than maybe we had realized, that actually we were finding ways to cope, we were putting things together, but it didn't stop us from feeling a bit exhausted, a bit tired. I actually commented to someone that normally it would take me an hour to commute to my office and I would always be early, Yet somehow working from home, I was running to my laptop in the morning that somehow I seemed to have less energy being in the house than I had being outside. Because I think we're designed um, to be active and to be engaging in the world around us. We lost friends, we lost families, we lost neighbors, we lost colleagues. One of my students in the office that she works lost three members of staff to death in less than a year within the pandemic. And what that did is it kept bringing it closer and closer to, closer and closer to us. Like, oh, now we know people who are being affected and, and who are losing their lives. Because some people we knew didn't lose their lives. We found new routes. We found new ways of walking. I found I suddenly had times to turn left instead of normally that in the same way I always did because I'm always rushing to get something done and realize actually I live surrounded by green spaces that I had never noticed before because there just wasn't time for it. We found new ways of doing things like actually working from home and being able to be productive and get a lot of things done. We spent more time with family or some spent more time with family. We found more space in the day whether it is we took up walking or exercise, baking was very popular, mm -hmm. trying to find eggs. Do you remember that? The things that we didn't think were going to cause a crisis. We realized we didn't have to live and work in the same area. So suddenly people were buying property and there was a big boom in, in people kind of exiting London. We didn't have to deal with the rush hour commute. That is the thing that I have to say I was most grateful for in the whole thing is not rushing around and being crammed in on the London underground. We showed great community spirit, checking in on the elderly, clapping for NHS workers, considering our neighbours. We showed that actually we continue to be a diverse people, whether we're in a pandemic or not in a pandemic, that there was this real human capacity for togetherness and compassion and reaching out. We show that we have those tendencies. Um, oh, I was about to slick the, the slide myself. Andrew, can you, can you click for me, please? Of course, yeah, there's, there's some comments in the chat box there as well, Joanne. A lot of people agreeing with you. There's one comment that stands out to me about putting on weight, which definitely I feel a lot of people may have done that. It's yes. a <laughs> and I do come back to that, but yes, I agree. I don't know why I didn't see that, but thank you for pointing it out. Um, ah, thank you. So we were definitely, there was elevated stress and anxiety. And this is me thinking the mental health concerns because I, I saw a comment briefly that said there were positive things and I completely agree. And I encourage you to write down the positives for me, maybe in the chat so we can comment on those. Um, Elevated stress and anxiety, definitely, for many people, there was an increase in stress and anxiety. There was an increase in domestic violence. Many people felt trapped in their traumas because they didn't have the usual mechanisms for, um, for switching off, for unwinding, for avoiding, for whatever it was. There wasn't the usual ways of creating space so that you're not just thinking about this thing. Um, for some people, there was a real loneliness. Leaving the house with a routine to go to work or to go to college meant that you had a structure. If you live on your own, 
Um, you may not have a strong family connection or a lot of people that you're connected to. And someone has then come out and said, OK, you're not also going to work and we don't really want you to leave the house unless you have to. Then suddenly the world gets a bit lonely. Or if you were someone who was living in a room, you know, in a flat share and other people went back to their families, there was loads of reasons to suddenly find yourself on your own and not feeling particularly good about where you are. Um, we lost our social routines, our networks, and this led to certain feelings of alienation. And for some people, they felt abandoned. It triggered what I would call an old story of feeling left and feeling alone. There was very real concerns about money. There was furlough, there was redundancy, uncertainty about jobs. We started to feel detached from the world because the structure that held the world in place for us was removed and we didn't have time to plan. Now, Andrew, I'm going to check with you. Have I missed anything in the chat with people mentioning? Uh, if you just click on the chat at the top, the 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 um the bubble, the chat bubble at the top, you'll be able to access all the chats because we've got absolutely loads of comments in there, and so many of them, I mean, all of them are fantastic. Um, we've got, I mean, can you see the chat box, Joanne? I can see more now. I think the screen yeah. needed to refresh. Yeah, so. absolutely. If you want to just have a little look, I don't know if there's anything that st stands out in there. Um, so, Alison, a positive for me is having my dog to sit with me and walk, which got me out and about. Absolutely, same here. Um, Joseph, um, oh, just saying thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we've got comments saying I've been living off adrenaline for the past 18 months, running uh, a care home. I'm starting to feel absolutely shattered now. Yeah, I yeah, I can just imagine that. Uh, thank you for your for your comment. Um, again, there's a the comment from John. I used to spend hours commuting, but now have a better work life balance at home. My general health has improved, and I used to always have colds and flus and feel run down. So lots of various uh, different comments um, and feedback in terms of how they reacted to the lockdown and you know how they're feeling now, whether it's at work or at home. I don't know if there's anything that stands out for you, Joanne. Well, I'm just I am reading Mark's comments, I think, is Mark Grimes. Even with my glasses, I have to really pay attention. <laughs> and it's just it just really warmed me because Mark is saying he was lucky his family fell with ill with COVID in the first few weeks of lockdown, despite living in an area that wasn't hit by it for some time. Um, uh, someone just emails me. Um, and it allowed us to understand the importance of seriousness of the scenario, but it mm -hmm. also allowed us to fall in love with the home again, spend time with family, learn more about where I live and found time and capacity to start volunteering. Um, Myblackdog.co.uk such you know what a positive to be able to experience it all and I think it's so important because what I'm getting from Marx and from a number of people who are talking about learning to appreciate the things taken for granted is it wasn't just one story lockdown wasn't just one thing of darkness or anxiety and it wasn't just one thing of isn't this just joyous and I, I never want it to end Actually, we were still having to find our way through and make sense of what was happening. But the idea about appreciating different things and the taken for granted is the real consistent part of the story. So thank you for sharing. Um, ooh, OK, I can't read all those comments. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing. Can hmm? I go to the next slide? Yes, please. Am I shouting now? <laughs> yeah, you're loud and clear. Good. So the impact really for lockdown is our real sense of life and living was challenged. And the challenge doesn't always have to be a bad thing. Someone mentioned living with adrenaline and, and that is exhausting, especially 18 months. Um, stress is necessary uh, in the olden days, you know, we're going back thousands of years stress was was how we were alerted to the fact that an animal was chasing us to eat us right we need to know when we're in danger stress serves a purpose but nobody's supposed to live in a state of constantly thinking about danger that is where burnout happens 
So stress is supposed to be balanced with time out. The, the initial challenge of lockdown was stressful, but for a lot of people, so that with the couples I work with, for some, as soon as lockdown was announced, they broke up. It was like, I am really clear that I cannot live with you, especially with no other options. But for many other couples, they got closer. They were able to share a vulnerability and be scared and find a way out together. So it's been a real interesting to see. It's kind of been like a shaken up and see what was left after the lockdown, after the crisis. Yes, some people, because they felt more connected to what was happening, it's not that we weren't in a crisis, but they were so attached to where their loved ones were, where their support was or what was happening for them, that it felt manageable, if that makes sense. Mm. Restrictions drove a mental health decline for some and reopening has brought about some social anxiety. If you've really spent 18 months avoiding people and avoiding crowds and not hugging anybody and not touching anybody just in case, because there was a time we weren't sure how it was transmitted. So some of us were particularly jumpy and, you know, side eyeing people in queues standing too close to them. Um, and someone says, OK, you can go back now. Everything's fine. You may not know how to go back into crowds again. I that is the thing that bothers me the most, actually, the crowds. I'm quite happy traveling around on my own where there's some space. But for those of us who have to be in work for 9 or 8.30, um, you're working with the rush hour crowd. You can't really avoid crowds in the same way. Um, how we think about looking after ourselves, prioritizing our emotional and mental health, then it's taken up more importance because now we're having to go back to thinking. It's like having had a bit of a break. Uh, and then you got to get back into work mode in a very different way because you have been working. You've been working from home. Not everyone was able to recognize what their mental health needs were or know where to get help or even feel entitled to get help. As a therapist, I have to say I was booked up solid because for some people, therapy became the space where they had at least someone to talk to. They didn't feel like they had access to, um, well, like I said, if you were living, if you were in the younger population and you're living in a house with other flatmates and they've decided to go home because they can work from home, if you were the one with family difficulties or maybe your family's overseas, they're not near with you, then who did you have to talk to? Um, but recognizing actually when are you having, what does it feel like to have an emotional health difficulty? Do you even connect with that in yourself? Do you know when you are off balance? How attuned are you to what you need? I'll let you, I say I'll let you, like I'm giving permission, but it'd be great if you could put some responses in the chat for me to get a sense of how many people feel like they know when something is going wrong doesn't mean you need a therapist, but you just recognize that something isn't right within yourself. Some people in the traditional methods of coping not at hand, many people use food. So they overate, they underate. Some people use drugs, some people use alcohol. I had a young person talking to me about using drugs and I'm like, in a lockdown, how is that happening? And that somehow people have designed ways to get things through the post. And I thought, wow, I expected that those would be the statistics that were coming down, but they were not. Uh, the local, well, around where I live anyway, all the local shops had literally sold out of alcohol. Like, you couldn't find it. Some people took up jogging and exercise. So at certain points in the day, the roads were really busy because the gyms were closed. You know, we saw this little army of runners on the road trying to get in a little exercise. We built our resilience and we survived. We found a way to survive and that's really important because what I'm connecting with so far is our attachments helped us 
and they fed our resilience and we realized that we had something in us that could help us get through this. I mentioned the couples before. Now I'm going to attempt to look in the chat again and see. Yeah. Um, We've had yeah some really um some really good comments come through. Uh, Amy, I'm very aware of other people's emotions, but I struggle to recognise my own until burnout is actually happening. I really identified with what you mentioned about not feeling entitled to therapy and or prioritising mental health too. Um, yeah, absolutely. And Michelle, I can feel myself slipping into a dark place, and sometimes I can stop it. Or that might have meant can't stop it either or. Um, we've got a few from, let's have a little look. Elena, when you get agitated easy and things that do not bother you, usually out of, out of the sudden get you upset. Yep. Yeah, there's lots of comments to get through here. Um, Sue, I can spot the trigger behaviours and reach out for support. Great. Anything that stands out for you, Joanne? The screen flicked on me, but they, I saw someone mention connecting physically with their body. So noticing that actually their body will tell them something is wrong before their mind connects with the fact that something is wrong. I'm sorry I didn't catch your name before it went. That is really important. The exhaustion and the inability to concentrate and those things are often your body saying to you, now's a good time to take a break or to make time for a break, because I realize that life doesn't always listen to us and we may want a break and we can't take it straight away, but to be able to plan it is important. Mm -hmm. um, and John, I think it's John Goodwin, the screen is flicking, I guess, because so many comments are coming yeah. through, um, realizing how, how resilient you were, but that you survived. I think that's really important to look back and realize you made it through is really important for building your, your sense of capability and competence. I can, and I did. And I didn't always know how I was doing it, but I did it. That's important. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people making reference to being exhausted. Yeah, I was gonna say that. This, that word's been used quite frequently. Yes, and I think that stress is exhausting. And freestyling, if you think about it, we're prepared for almost everything else in life, right? There are so many things. And, and to even have a job, you go to school, you have all these exams and preparations. Nobody prepares you for a pandemic. How do you prepare for an unexpected global pandemic? <laughs> As I just, my mind went back to all the toilet paper selling out at the start. For some people, that was the end of their preparations. But the reality is all of us had to freestyle. Nobody knew what we were doing. And I wondered how much that tapped into the community spirit, the ability to say, how are you neighbor? How are you so-and-so? Because we realized that we maybe we needed to talk to people to get through this. Absolutely. Andrea, can you um, click okay. on me, please? Yeah. Thank you. Even returning to work um, appears to have divided society. So we have some people who are anxious, some who are compliant. We have the rebels. Uh, and the rebel doesn't have to be someone who's into a conspiracy about it. They can just feel strongly about their rights and their choices. And actually, this is what I want to do. And we have the conscientious trying to think about others and stay grounded. And this is... This is not meant to be exhaustive, but to trigger out thinking, who are you in this all and in this returning to work? What does it mean? To what extent do you trust the people in power who created the rules to keep you safe? How does this impact what you choose to do? How do you decide who to be with all that has been created in this pandemic context? Actually, that's something I'd like people to give some responses to. But everything that has been going on, how do you decide who to trust? Some of my clients have said to me, they learned to really trust themselves more mm -hmm. because they didn't really trust the voices of the people around. Um, 
Yes, I see Michaela dread the run up into the winter and all the bugs. I hear that. Alison, um, it's key for me is a uh, personal choice. Mm -hmm. Jan, I'm very anxious about getting on public transport as my route to work is really, really busy and there's a lot of informal pressure masked as encourage encouragement to return to the office and I'm not ready to take that risk. I have elderly parents, sorry that message, um, elderly parents and I can't afford to pass it on to them and there are no windows we can open in my office. Yeah, um, Lucy, I'd say I'm an anxious compliant. I will follow the instructions, but I'm not always comfortable with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, seen a few of those comments come through. Uh, Deborah, trust that you have an effective voice and someone is listening. Yes, and, and Sue's point is really um, jumped out at me the loss of autonomy in the directive to return choice is so important if we want to feel a sense of empowerment right that i am choosing to do this and not many people are being given that choice uh, that is that is something to think about okay can we go to the next slide please i trust the science and politics Thanks, Stacey. So now we're returning to the office with all these things and knowing that actually this is not our first choice. This is not what we would necessarily do. Um, and so when I asked about leadership, whether it's the government, whether it's your management, how you feel about the people making the decisions is going to influence how you feel about returning to the office. I put plan and prepare for the return. What does that mean? I often think about being younger and getting ready to go to school after the holiday, the summer break. You know, you've had, I mean, not that we have been on holiday, this is nowhere near uh, as relaxing as that was, but there has been some change. So I was invited, I, I lecture uh, on occasion, not, not in a structured way. And I was invited to a lecture on Friday and so I did what I thought I would normally do when I'm going to work, right? I choose what I'm wearing. Could it fit? I realized how I managed with the lockdown when my clothes don't fit me. <laughs> Even my shoes didn't feel as comfortable. Uh, it was in central London and I, the, track, the journey there was fine. I said I'd be, it was starting at 10. I said I'd be there for half nine because I don't like the anxiety of running late. I got there at 9.45, why? because I forgot to allow the time it takes to walk from the tunnel <laughs> when you get off the underground to the building. And I had to laugh at myself. It's a silly thing, but actually I haven't done it for so long. I just didn't think about it. I didn't think about it. Uh, so how do you prepare for work? Because preparation can be really important this is what they tell you when you have exams, you make sure you revise so you feel more confident on the day, right? The preparation for the return to the office is really important. What are the, the protocols, right? What are they asking you to do when you get into the office? Do you have to wear masks? Do you have to wash your hands a number of times? Are you... Are there less people in the office? Are there more? I mean, what are the rules now? And where can you check? what is expected of you when you return to the office. Speaking to your line manager about your concerns, your needs, the options, that would help you feel safer and more productive. What do you need from the office to be able to do what you have to do? And, but to do that, you need to know what your, your entitlements are. Hence I say, what are the protocols and how can you establish what you need? Anxiety is high. We've talked a lot about stress and mental health over the last, I was going to say, 20 years or so. People keep trying to raise that. Managers are meant to be more aware. And I say managers, I mean, managers may be stressed and exhausted too. They're having to deal with life also. But it should be easier to have a conversation saying, I recognize this is what ex is expected. I need to negotiate. I need to be able to have a planned route. 
uh, where people do things like phased returns or negotiate days in the office or hours in the office and need to be able to have that or I'm not going to be able to be very productive or cope particularly well when I get here. Be honest in your conversation. Make time to connect with your colleagues in person. This doesn't have to be a lengthy, you know, it doesn't have to be lunch together as nice as that is. And if you want to do that, do that. But even the experience of connecting with people in person again, you know, whether it's over the water cooler or the biscuit tin or the, um, the kitchen boiling the kettle, it's so important to have those little human check-ins. I think the good thing, which I said to young people who are returning to school and they were like, we don't want to go back. We're comfortable at home. My bedroom is really comfortable. Is realizing, realizing that everyone is sharing a certain amount of anxiety right now. So that is what's on your side. To be able to speak and trust that the other person understands you're just trying to connect again. I've forgotten how to do small talk. So that's what those little five minute little check-ins can be. Now it's up to you whether you want to do small talk or say something much more like, this is, this is really hard. I don't want to be here. What can we do? But speak. Don't try to do everything in one go. Don't feel like you have to show up back day one and everything be perfect. Go back and see how it feels for you. And really connect um, I should have put these merged two sentences a bit better here. When I say see how things play out, make time in the day to reflect on the day. At what point in the day did you notice your stress levels going up? At what point in the day did you feel most comfortable? Because if it is the commute specifically, and it might help you to come into work when the rush hour is, it's just passed or to get there before. I mean, you have to figure out when you felt it. Then that's something you that's something that you can talk about and have something done with. But don't feel like you have to have a really comprehensive everything in one go as soon as you get there. You kind of need to be able to check the day and then reflect on the week and see how things go for you hour by hour, day by day, week by week. Make time for yourself to be able to do that. There is a potential for you to create an opportunity because this is also new. So give yourself space to really think about what fits for you. And then I always say this thing, be patient with yourself. You're doing the best you can. And for the last 18 months, my heart is still with the person who talked about running on adrenaline for the last 18 months, running a care home. You have done the best that you can. That is important to remember. So compassion should also be leading you when you reflect on what you did and how the day went and whether you could have done more, whether you could have done less. What do you think of what I'm saying so far? Oh, that's a comment. Lots of comments coming through. I can't believe how many um, have popped up. <laughs> There's, um, let's have a little look. Uh, oh, where is I? Kelly. Uh, oh, I can't even keep up with them all. Um, Amy's made a couple of good points. I'll try and find a comment from uh, Amy. I st oh, this was a funny one, actually. I started culture and language exchanges during the lockdowns. Now I always have a friend to talk to because of all the time differences. <laughs> um, Mark, my priorities um, as the leader have been one, the team, two, the team, three, the job. This has um, helped to offer the best service we can, even in times of difficulty. Without listening to the team, you are instantly on the back foot. Yet it is, um, oh, sorry, I've lost that. Missed that last part because there's so many messages coming through. Sorry about that, Mark. Um, if you could type that last bit out, that would be fantastic. Uh, so uh, definitely recovery is never linear. Um, imagine what this would have been like without social media. I think it has kept us connected um, throughout. Uh, Mark, yet, sorry, so this was a comment from before, yet it is uh, so often overlooked by the decision makers. Absolutely. And that was in, re that was in regards to the, uh, the team and his job. 
Um, Claire, I was going to point out yeah. Claire, I think her name was Claire, who was making biscuits and sharing. Claire, yeah. please let me know where I can find you. Because <laughs> that's the spirit of getting back into the office, right? Absolutely. What can we all bring and share to say, gosh, I've missed you guys. Let's check in. Let's catch yeah. up. There was also a comment about new new employees. There might well be. Claire yeah. Jenkins, I just saw one of the difficulties has been new people onboarding during this time. They don't get the culture, which can cause difficulties. Um, <laughs> all right, Claire, I let go of the biscuit wish. Um, I think I get I don't know if I fully understand the um they don't get the culture, but there is something about be you know the clients I had who were new employees didn't quite know how to place themselves. It's a fair point. How do you if you if you're not around the team to see how people work together, you know, who neutralizes the other, who's the activist, who's the supporter, who's the pacifist? It, you don't know, how do you figure out how to place yourself? We're back to this, lockdown took the structure away. And how do you look out for the new people and kind of help them connect with where it is? Um, as lovely as the team may be, you, you can't know because you haven't had a, a chance to feel them. Mm. That's, that's a fair, that is a very fair point, it's difficult. Julie made a good comment. Um, we have had so many people joining us over the last 18 months, so it will be a new environment for everyone as we go back, almost a whole new environment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some people haven't been home, uh, back to work at all in the last 18, 19 months. So what work, what work was like prior definitely won't be what work will be like going back. Um, and it would be interesting, I mean, I did ask the question earlier on about who was working from home. Is there anyone that is going back, is not going back to work at all? Or is there anyone who is just about to go back? It would be interesting to see the differences. It's interesting. I just say Elaine's point that even baking isn't as straightforward as it used to be because there are rules about sharing and bringing in things to share. Mm -hmm. um, Carol, we are not going back anytime soon. Stacey, um, ooh, messages again. I live in Inverness and work for the NHS. No time scales for going back into the office. So people are still very much up in the air with what's happening. Um, I know personally, I've got a few friends who still have no idea as to when they're returning. Uh, mm. So they're quite, they're quite, they're feeling quite on the end of their seat about when the news will come in that they have to return. Yes, and how much someone who had mentioned choice before, it's really important. I've actually encouraged the, the clients I work with to have straight and direct conversations with your line managers or your HR, whoever's your first point of call, to find out what your options are. There were people in the lockdown who developed agoraphobia and other phobias because they were staying away from people and you know, it's very real. So to be able to have an honest conversation about anxiety, mental health, and what you need is important. So that you feel like you have some say and some choice. And there are some legal requirements to support people with mental health difficulties. So I would be amazed that someone says, oh, I say I shouldn't be amazed really. Let's just say you have rights. So it's important you speak with your HR and your line manager about how those can be facilitated, you know, to everyone's um, productivity. How are we doing? The signs of, uh, thank you, Andrea, skillfully mm -hmm. done. I thought I would just put in something to help people reconnect with signs that you may have emotional mental health concerns. When I worked in the NHS, we had what you would call the kind of biological signs. And this is where people would get medication. If you didn't have biological signs, then you would be offered therapy. The biological signs is to notice your sleep pattern. Has that changed? 
Are you sleeping too much? Are you sleeping too little? Or is it interrupted sleep? Are you, do you keep waking up in the night? Um, your appetite, how has that changed? Now, I know many of us can, can think about how much, how we've eaten differently in the lockdown. Um, if that is consistent and for some time, for some people when they depress, for example, they stop eating. That's never been me, but some people, they completely lose their appetite. They lose their concentration. Those things are really important for helping you function. This is why the biological symptoms are important. You start losing interest in things, the things that used to give you joy, whether it is um, to watch something on TV, to read a book, to play a game, whatever it was, your joy is not my joy, right? So whatever gave you joy, when you start realizing you're not getting anything from it anymore, that's worth thinking about and noticing. Any one of these things on its own doesn't have to be problematic. When you start getting a few together, um, and I would add to losing interest is losing the will. When you just don't want to, that motivation. At a more entrenched levels, thoughts of death. When you, and I, I didn't say plans. I mean, definitely if you have plans, speak to someone. But if you're thinking about what would be the options, then those are things that you can speak to your GP about because actually there's been a rise in people feeling these things and needing to get help for it. Now, as with all things, I ask people to connect to where they are personally. If you've ever had depression or anxiety or both, then you have your own unique signs that may tell you that something's going on. So I have someone I work with, and it's not that their quality of sleep changes, but what they dream about becomes consistent. They have a particular dream that recurs for them. It's important that you attune to yourself so that you know your signs, and that's important so that you can get help. Um, I just noticed the time as well. I'm gonna okay, jump to the thanks. next slide. I'm gonna, yeah. thank you. Coping and resources. So I've put in just off the top of my head, this is not compulsory, going for walks. I keep bringing up walks. I walked much more this lockdown. Uh, but even before that, when I did my work around trauma, one of the things they say is trauma interrupts the brain's ability to process. That's one of these popular therapy words. But the brain's ability to think through what happened because you were so shocked by it, something freezes and you're just not able to think it through. So trauma therapy is never about how you remove the event or feel nothing for the event. It's how you allow it to feel your way through the event so you can see new things. Uh, and one of the advice when doing trauma work is to encourage people to take walks, at least half an hour walks, purposeful. So not that floaty kind of walk where if the breeze doesn't move, you're hardly moving. It should have some purpose with it, but be moving. Take breaks. I spoke to so many people who, in trying to manage the lockdown, they use their commute time to work. So they started work at seven in the morning and then kept going till eight in the evening. That, you, nobody's supposed to live like that. And they didn't really take lunch breaks because they just wanted to absorb themselves in an activity to distract themselves from what was going on. When I go back to what I said about stress and adrenaline, no mind, no psyche is designed to live that way. So it's really important that you take a break, doesn't matter how long it is, but it should be in every day, there should be a break. And in every week, you should have a space. And that break doesn't have to mean do nothing. It could be actively doing what brings you pleasure, whatever that is, but it should not be work and stress related. Some people are good at grounding techniques. You know, those things where people say, keep both feet on the ground and really connect to your feet on the ground so that you feel very aware 
that you are somewhere being held. The other are the breathing techniques. You take a deep breath, hold for 10, and then release for 10. All of those things, they, I mean, sometimes with panic attacks as well, people are told to, um, to sip, whether it's a tea or some water, because it forces your body to breathe differently. So if you're holding your breath or getting really tight, those things can be helpful for forcing you to do something different, which relaxes you physiologically, but not necessarily mentally. Make time for being creative and play. There was a comment I went past um, because they're coming in so far, so I can read it all. When someone said they learned from their children and the way that they coped, play is essential to healing. And it's important with children, children play, if you pay attention to their play, you often learn a lot about what happened in the day <laughs> and who did what or how they may have felt about something because they play it out. As adults, we don't really give ourselves permission to play in the same way, which is sad. I mean, I'm not saying all the time, I appreciate we're responsible, we have jobs, people have expectations on us. But to make time within your week, where there is a type of playfulness that you can engage with, that creativity. And that's important because that's healing for the mind. You can let something out and you may not even know what it is that's coming out, but the, the, the mind, the psyche processes something when you're playing without needing the language because it's just working its way through. I hope that's making sense to people. Absolutely. And I, I put this question to you. What do you normally do? What resources do you have to manage anxiety, stress? I should include depression, worry. What do people do? Seen a few comments. Uh, a couple of people have mentioned meditation. Meditation, yes. Yeah, um, listening to music, whether that's through headphones or just openly. Um, someone has put... Um, Love and agree with all these different te techniques. We are trying to set up a creative group within our workspace as we return to the office, which is a great idea. Yes. Yoga, of course, knitting, lots of sleep, um, dancing, yes. reading, yes. tapestry, crosswords. So these are some of the things you can do in the workplace. Um, you're not restricted. Do your work well I, you're not all in the same place I used to uh, when I worked in social services they used to have someone come in once a week that would do massages mm, yeah I've heard of that yeah I think my friend um she she got someone to come to her office to do it <laughs> so that's quite that would be quite a nice resource if it's available and um, yes people get your um what do you call the box where you put in good ideas for managers to think on oh yeah yeah in uh, that's actually, I might um, bring that forward to my my manager. I don't think he's listening right now, but I'll make sure that he gets the recording. <laughs> um, hit classes, yes. Uh, I do three hit classes a week and I've found that that's really, really helped me loads. Um, box breathing is my superpower. <laughs> breathing for four, hold out for four. Hold in for four, I think, in so many. Um, I've done a lot of decorating. Nice, nice. Someone said a good cry too, and I thought, yes, that's a good idea. It is also okay to cry. Mm -hmm. Fighting tears is more damaging than just letting yourself have a cry and then moving on, because it means you're not giving yourself permission to just be human. So permission to be human can also be very relaxing. Yeah, and obviously opposite of crying is laughing, Mark says. Uh, I laugh. <laughs> We all need that. That's medicine for the soul, that. Absolutely. Some really great comments coming through. Thank you. And I'll be taking some of them on board as well. Binging trashy TV. Sometimes you just have to yes. watch really rubbish TV from time to time where your brain doesn't need to engage in anything. Mum's um, home cooking. These people are understanding me. You see, I found the biscuits. Now I've found Mark Grimes, Mum's Home Cooking. Mark, send some details in. Let's all head to Mark's house. <laughs> Being kind and random acts of kindness. Yes. Smiling at people because you want to, right? 
There's no, you, you don't have to, it's not mandatory. <laughs> Jane the Virgin and the crazy ex-girlfriend got me through lockdown. Beautiful. <laughs> Brilliant. Actively okay. engaging in things like this webinar and learning strategies to help us is so important. I love smiling at people. Uh, now the mask wearing is less. Yes. Right. Races. Okay, well, please do keep your comments coming in because we love to see that even though the chat box is, box is going so crazy, we can't keep up with messages. It's just so nice to hear from you all and share experiences. Well, yeah, and um, so keep it coming. Uh, we still do have 10 minutes left, but um, as mentioned earlier on in the, the webinar, um, this is just a very condensed bite size. Um, I guess, discussion of what is to be expected in the full course. Uh, we mentioned that the full course will be taken, the first one will be taken on Wednesday, the 27th of October, but that, that doesn't mean to say we won't be doing more. We definitely, definitely will be. So um, it's just a matter of coming together with Joanne to work out some dates. But um, the full course is called Normalising Emotional and Mental Health in the Workplace. There's a little bit about the course on the screen, but Joanne, I don't suppose you could just give a quick little run through about what's to be expected um on the day itself i will try <laughs> <laughs> so what i would say I, i'm always keen to say emotional and mental health conversations i i never want to make them um too prescriptive right i am really keen on saying and what do you try because i think there are what the books say and then there's the living your life is um is that you know the more we can hear from people and generate ideas, the more we can connect to our own individuality in managing emotional and mental health. My intention in um, putting together this workplace, workplace workshop is really to facilitate a sense of normalizing it. It's not because we reach work that we stop having feelings. Right. We don't become robots at the door like we, we've all got a life. Um, and there was a comment I didn't quite get to finish reading about, and what do you do when you have children or young children? The demands on our times are constant. And sometimes by the time we finish giving everywhere else, we're running really empty for ourselves. And we, we kind of need to keep fueling so we can keep going, not just for society. This is not about self-sacrifice. So what I want to do here is help us think about emotional and mental health within your life, what that means when you get to work and how you can work with it in the workplace. What does it mean? How do you, sometimes when I speak to people, a lot of people speak to me often about um, relational dynamics at work that makes the I mean sometimes it's that people are working at levels they're not being challenged they need something different but sometimes there's things that are why don't you speak to your manager oh they should know why should they know this is your life it's important to you you have to put things out there and let people understand this is how it's affecting you this is how it's affecting productivity this is what it means so that when I engage with people about these things my hope is that it won't just help you at work but it will help you wherever you are as a human being how to use your voice is really important to managing your emotional and mental health because sometimes we're not using our voices effectively knowing who to talk to and when to talk is also important uh, and knowing how to tap into your sense of resilience, work into your confidence. So those are a few of the things that I want to be helping people to connect with so that they can feel a bit more um, in a sense of competence when they're in the workplace. And then there are always things that you may need to speak to someone about. Yes, that, that, uh, that um, when we get I guess, out of emotional health and more into mental health difficulties or problems where you may need a therapist or a short-term intervention. 
But even how to know when that may be something you need is not always something that people know. So those are the kind of ideas I have for that day. Absolutely. Thank you, Joanne. Um, so we've had so many comments and questions throughout, but um, I'm going to leave it to you guys. If you do have any questions for Joanne, please pop them in the comments box. Um, any questions that don't get answered, I'm sure I can pop them over to Joanne and she'll she'll try and answer them in the future. But um, feel free to pop some questions in there if there's anything that you would like to ask Joanne. Um, in relation to the full day course, um, my email address was on the previous slide. I'll just put it back there a second. Um, so it's andrea at civilservicecollege.org.uk if you would like to find out more information about that course or you can visit the website. Um, Again, questions, please feel free to use the chat box. I know that we have um, went through so many questions and comments throughout. There's been absolutely loads. I think there's been a few, feels like there's been a few hundred. Um, so we will try and um, go back through those in a second, but please feel free to use that chat box now. Um, I'll move on whilst you do have a think. Um, if my yep. slide wants to move along. Um, if you want to find out more about the webinars that we do, we do try to do them once or twice every single month. Uh, to find out more about our webinars, please sign up to Training Alerts uh, on the website there at www.civilservicecollege.org.uk. Um, we actually have a webinar coming up. I think it, it is more for the female audience. Um, it's on Tuesday, the 5th of October um, in contribution to World Menopause Awareness Month. We are running a workshop with uh, our trainer, Katie Day, from Menopause Mayhem to Midlife Magic, Celebrate Your Second Spring. And it's um, a lot of the things she'll be talking about will be in relation to the workplace as well. So if you do want to find out more information about that, please do go to our webinar section on the website and we are on instagram facebook twitter linkedin and of course this recording will go on youtube as well and we will be sending the recording out with the slides to you in due course but do stay connected with us and that's our social media handle on there and um, joanne there's lots of lovely comments coming through there and um, just thanking you it was a fantastic session um, I've never seen so many comments come through to the point where we couldn't even finish reading them, which is crazy. Um, so I don't know if there's anything that's popped up in the chat box, Joanne, that um, you might want to answer. Thank you for yep. your comments, guys. There was someone who said, I mean, it's gone now, so I may misquote the comment that said, it seemed to be targeted to people working from home, but what about those returning to the office? I was actually trying to think about those returning to the office. And um, it, what I'm encouraging is to really be honest about what, what it is you're feeling, what are your concerns, and have an explicit conversation about your emotional, mental health, you know, because you know what that is for you. So what, articulate it, and speak to your line manager and negotiate. You may need to negotiate a phased return. You may need to do a day and see, attune yourself to how you feel and what's missing and when you felt the most discomfort and then have a conversation about that really honestly. Uh, and so I'm pushing as a therapist would for some conversation. Uh, and then after that, thinking about the things you do to help you manage your anxieties um, and then I think Mark said the men may also benefit from learning about menopause I agree sign up men is it is the menopause <laughs> session a, 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 I said, absolutely we'd love some males to attend of course Don't and thank you so much for commenting it makes a big difference yeah uh, and we, we do love to hear from everyone and um, as mentioned at the start of the webinar your comments and your feedback and your experiences are very very important and um, for some of our trainers because obviously they want to hear from you throughout so I hope everyone has enjoyed the session and can benefit from it Joanne you've been absolutely fantastic it's been a pleasure to work with you and we hope that we see some of our participants at our full day course in October um, thank you very much, everybody. And again, if you do have questions, send them to me and I can um, perhaps work with Joanne and get those answered as soon as possible. Thank you very much. For having me.
Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you and have a lovely day. Thanks. Bye now. Bye.